The following audio is from Shiloh Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. More information about Shiloh Presbyterian Church is available at shilohopc.org. You can turn in your Bibles to Psalm 150, which will be our text for this evening. Page 526 in the Pew Bibles. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word, for the reading and the hearing of it. This word, this this call to worship. This universal call to worship. Now, Lord, grant strength to your servant, who is a weak man with feet of clay. A man who needs for himself the very same redemption that he offers to others when he preaches the gospel. As Isaiah said, Woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. The Lord cleanse my lips. That your word may go forth in power unto the edification of your people and the glory of your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many did their homework this afternoon? Are you afraid to raise your hands? You're saying, this is a Presbyterian church. We don't know how to raise our hands, and we certainly don't know how to say hallelujah, do we? Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah! Remember, we're exhorting one another to praise the Lord when we say those words. I am a lenient professor. I'm a pushover. I will give you until the next time I visit to do your homework, and you can turn in your papers then. Uh, In case there was someone who is not here this morning, the homework was to look at Psalm 114. It's only eight verses. I wasn't asking you to do very much this afternoon. And to see, looking at those eight verses, why would it be placed in the Psalter between these two triads of Hallelujah Psalms in this chiastic structure, the top of the ladder? Remember that illustration? Songs that were sung by God's people as they commemorated God's mighty saving act of delivering them from bondage in Egypt and unto the promised land. Those who did your homework know why Psalm 114 is where it is. I want to remind you in many of the insights that I've seen in in terms of the structure. They're right there on the face of the text almost. I don't know why I never saw them. But I take comfort in the fact that I don't think hardly anybody ever did uh, before Dr. Robertson uh, began to look. There were others. There were others who... Uh, who saw some of these things, and he utilizes their research uh, in his own. The flow of the Psalter, that there is reason and purpose in it, that there's a biblical theology that's there, that God gave to his people in exile a little Bible, a little Bible of poetry, easy to memorize, that they could hide away in their hearts to encourage them as they lived in a foreign land. 
a book that begins with confrontation in book one of the Psalter between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, between God's covenant people and the world, and then progresses, as Dr. Robertson points out, to the communication in book two, actually calling upon the world, you come worship Jehovah too. And then as you move further in there to devastation, as persecution and the hand of discipline comes upon his own people in exile in book three, four of those Psalms in book three actually describe the exile itself, one of the northern kingdom, three of the southern kingdom. And then maturation, book four, that is growing, growing in grace even when you're not in the promised land. Even when Jerusalem was desolate and the temple was destroyed. And that book begins, interestingly enough, with Psalm 90. Anybody know who wrote Psalm 90? Moses. Moses. Moses wrote Psalm 90. In the wilderness, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before ever thou didst form the heavens of the earth, thou art the Lord. What a fitting psalm now, hundreds of years later, to be sung while they dwelt in another foreign land. Jerusalem's destroyed, but Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. And then book 5, Psalms 107 to 150, consummation that ends in, in consummation praise with five hallelujah psalms in a row. Remember I told you this morning there are 15 hallelujah psalms? Let's see how well you can do. There's a triad of hallelujah psalms, the last three of book four, 104, 105, 106. For those who did your homework, it's easy to know what the next triad of hallelujah psalms are. 111, 112, 113, the next triad of hallelujah psalms, 115, 116, 117. The Psalter ends with the five hallelujah psalms. And then the one that's kind of out there all by itself, our text this morning, the foundation for the great Hallel, 135. So now we come to Psalm 150, the concluding psalm of the Psalter. The crescendo note, if you would have it, in this call of praise. I'm going to divide it this way. The outline's very simple. Where, why, how, and who. Think you can remember that? Where and a little bit of when. Where, when, why. How and who? Where? Where are we to say hallelujah? Where are we to speak those words to one another? There's no reason why you can't do it at home. There's no reason why you can't do it when you're driving down the street. You know, when someone comes in front of you, isn't that what you say? Hallelujah! <laughs> it should be. But where we really say the hallelujah, where we call upon each other to praise the Lord, is in the assembly. It's when we're here. Look at what he says. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his sanctuary. Another thing that we've find here is a shift in the name of God. It begins with hallelujah. Yah is a poetic shortened version of Yahweh, God's covenant name. But in the next line, it's hallelujah. Hallelujah. El, Elohim. You've heard that name before. It's the general name of God. Praise God, the covenant God who is God. Praise the Lord, the covenant Lord who is God. He is Elohim. He is El. Another thing that's interesting in the Psalter is to see the shift in emphasis on the names of God as you move from book one of confrontation with the name Yahweh is the 
the name that's used by and large more than any other in the first 41 Psalms. Because that sets off the people of God. It's God's covenant people over against the world. But then as you move from that confrontation to communication, a shift in emphasis, the name of God in book two that is used more than any other name is the name Elohim, the general name of God. You, you peoples, you nations, you come. This is the God you need to come and worship as well. Praise God in his sanctuary. Hallelujah in his sanctuary. What is the sanctuary? Well, there are differences of opinion about how to interpret that. Is the sanctuary the most holy place? You know the most holy place? The holy of holies. There's the holy place and the most holy place. Remember the veil that divided the holy place from the most holy place? That sanctuary, that holy place where the priest would go once a year with blood, with a cord tied to him in case he did something wrong. You know why the cord was tied? That's how they get his dead body out. Is that what's meant by sanctuary here? It is indeed true. Because of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and His cross, we have access into the Holy of Holies. Remember what happened when Jesus died on the cross? Remember the earthquake that occurred? Remember that veil? That veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place was rent from top to bottom by God. It's providing access for us to come into that most holy place. Jesus has burst down the doors, opened them wide for us to enter in. Or is sanctuary talking about the temple itself in the Old Covenant? Because under the Old Covenant, they couldn't go into the most holy place only by their representative, the high priest. It's the temple. That's where the people of God assembled to worship in the various courts. From the court of the Gentiles or the court of the nations where even the uncircumcised could go to pray. Except for when Annas Bazaar was there and they couldn't get in the door. Remember the court of the women where Jewish women could go? And then the court of Israel where only circumcised men could go? But they would go, and they would gather, and they would say hallelujah at the temple. But the temple is no more. The temple has been destroyed since 70 A.D. Jews gather at a wall and wail. But it is no more. Because Jesus has come. When we praise God in the sanctuary, it's here. And no, not this building. I like this building. It's better than a gymnasium. I don't have visions of Tim making a slam dunk <laughs> when I'm preaching. We are the sanctuary. God dwells in the midst of his people. He's here now. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. I memorized this in the old King James Version. That's where we memorize Psalms. They're better. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. We say, what does that mean? Well, you remember firmament? You remember firmament from Genesis, from the creation when God separated the waters above from the waters beneath? 
and the space in between he called the firmament, this expanse. We call it the heavens. Is this saying that we can only praise God if we're flying in an airplane? Or we can only praise God if we're a winged creature that's flying in the heavens? Or is it looking to heavens above the heavens that we see? We praise God in the firmament of His power. We praise God in His mighty heavens. We are praising God in His mighty heavens right now, according to the Apostle Paul. We are seated in Christ in the heavenlies right now. I can't get my mind around that. But it's true. And when we come together in this assembly, and when we worship God in this assembly, there is a centrality to worship in the new covenant. Even though we're worshiping in assemblies scattered all over this earth, we're worshiping in the presence of the heavens. Where God is seated on the throne and where God the Son is seated at His right hand. Where four living creatures surround the throne and never stop singing their praise to God. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. There are 24 thrones according to John's vision that surround that. I believe that's symbolic of the church. There are myriads of angels surrounding the throne singing praise to God. And when we sing our psalms and our hymns here, we are joining in that chorus. I wish we could just knock the roof out. We'll put it back afterwards. Just knock the roof out and then open up the canopy of the skies and through the eye of faith, see what's in heaven above. And we're worshiping in the presence of God. Do you recognize that when you come into the assembly? Lord's Day after Lord's Day. Oh, there's more glory here. I've said it before, you've heard me say it, than in 10,000 Passovers at the temple under the Old Covenant because Jesus has come. He's torn the veil asunder. There's nothing that keeps us from the presence, from being before the face of the living God. That is powerful. Where are we to praise God? In the sanctuary, where are we to praise Him? In the firmament of His power, in His mighty heavens. And when? In these Lord's Day assemblies, in particular. When? Right now. Right now. Why? Why are we to praise Him? Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Again, I like the old King James. Praise Him for His mighty acts. For His works of power. For creation. He spoke and it came into being. In six days, He created the heavens and the earth and all that dwell in them. And He rested the seventh day. Look at creation. And we can't see much of it because we're so tiny. Look at the heavens. They declare the glory of God. The stars cry out, look who made me. You know, the stars also cry out, I'm named after you. Did you know that? The descendants of Abraham will be numbered as the stars in the sky. If election be true, and the Bible teaches it's true, if God set His affection upon you before He said, let there be light, there's a star in heaven that's named after you.
Praise Him for His mighty acts, creation. Praise Him for His mighty acts, providence. His governance of what He has made. And in particular, those redemptive, saving acts of God. Remember, what's celebrated in the Hillel of Egypt. It's that Old Testament mighty saving act. God's people in bondage in Egypt. They were dispossessed of the land and in bondage to Egypt. The total period of time was 400 years. But then God raised his right arm and delivered them by his mighty power. Through signs and wonders. We read about it in Psalm 136 this morning. We read it antiphonally. You participated in that. For his signs and wonders in Egypt. For the plagues he brought upon the Egyptians. So he saved his people. He passed over the homes where the blood was applied. There was salvation within those homes. The next day the Pharaoh said, just leave. Just leave. Take whatever you want. Just leave. They come to a sea. How are we going to cross the sea? You know, there was something probably just under a million people. How are we going to cross the sea? And then Pharaoh's heart's hardening. And here comes Pharaoh's chariots behind them. An army behind them. A sea in front of them. How are they going to get through? And Moses raises his arm and what happens? The sea parts. And they cross on dry ground. His signs and wonders in Egypt. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. But all of those great acts in the Old Testament are types and shadows. Oh, they're glorious. They're wonderful. Until you turn the page of history and see what God has in store in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in His incarnation, in His death, in His burial, in His resurrection, and in His ascension, that great, mighty, saving act of all mighty, saving acts. Your salvation that makes the exodus type and a shadow by comparison to what he's done for us in Christ Jesus. How can you not say to each other, Hallelujah! How can you not? Praising him according to His excellent greatness, not just because of what He's done, but who He is. We saw it this morning. Who who is God? He's the God who dwells in the heavens. He's the God who made the heavens and the earth. He's the God, what does Psalm 135 say? Who does whatever He pleases. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him according to who He is. And the four living creatures that surround the throne, isn't that what they sing? Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're declaring His glorious attributes, His person, His being, His nature, who He is. We praise God for who He is. And we praise God for what He's done. And that's it. That's the why. Now the how. How are we to praise Him? Praise Him with the trumpet sound. Praise Him with a lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. That's how we're to praise the Lord. Who's going to bring the instruments next week? It means to praise Him with celebration 
and your heart. You need to recognize that some of these things actually are talking about what Levitical praise looked like. Remember, the old covenant that we have is a covenant that's given to his people in Israel. There is a ceremonial law that's given there. There is tabernacle temple worship that is prescribed in the word of God. There are all kinds of feasts and festivals that are there. There's law after law after law after law. Specific unto the holiness of the priest. We read them in Leviticus. We're saying, what is this that we're reading? This seems so foreign to us. You know, don't touch a dead body unless it's a member of a close member of the family. And these are the close members it can be. If it's somebody other than that, don't touch the dead body. You know, we're, we're reading these things and we're saying, what is all of this? All of these laws were given to Israel to set her apart as a holy people from the nations. But they are fulfilled in Christ Jesus and abrogated in Christ Jesus. And we see their measure and the spiritual sanctification of the people of God, of the saints, of the holy ones of God. And I am thankful for the abrogation of those laws. We need to recognize that there is, even though for in the old covenant worship, there's much pomp and ceremony, there's temple or, or tabernacle first and and specifics of how it was to be built. The same thing later with temple. There are holy artifacts, the Ark of the Covenant that was built. There's the holy furnishings that are in the tabernacle. There's the robes of the priests that are described in minute detail. And the consecration process that's involved for these holy artifacts and for the priests, for the holy oil of anointing. All of this that we see in the Old Covenant, feasts and festivals, all are prescribed. But they're types and shadows. Jesus has come. We find a far more simple worship in the New Covenant when we turn the page to the New Testament. But more powerful. Because Jesus has come. What we see is that we are to sing praises to God. I love having piano accompaniment. A couple of weeks ago, I, about three weeks ago, I met with a church that actually is petitioning to come into the OPC. The worship was robust. It was, it was wonderful. Preaching was great. <laughs> and we had piano and Five violins. We sang psalms and the great hymns of the faith. And I was sitting right beside the five violins. It was beautiful. But what's more beautiful is the substantive singing of Psalms and hymns to God that we can understand the meaning of the lyric that we sing. And I believe in New Covenant worship, which I do believe in the allowance of instruments such as this or violins. I, I don't care about those things. As, as long as their purpose to is to enhance the singing of praise. That we can understand the doctrine, the truth that we are singing unto God. Unintelligible worship is not true worship. Read 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. Paul says, I would rather speak five words in a language people can understand than thousands of words in an unknown tongue nobody can understand. What are, what are tongues, that, an old, a New Testament gift in the first century, but, but what are tongues without love? They're, they're clanging brass, they're sounding cymbals. There's no substance. 
You can't be edified because you can't understand what the clanging brass and sounding cymbal means. When we sing praise to God, it is intelligible. Whether it be the Psalms themselves, and I love the fact that this congregation sings a, a lot of Psalms. Because God has given us a hymn book. Or whether they be songs of the Lamb. That is faithful, faithful expositions of Scripture written in poetry, written in song, in light of the full revelation of God in Christ Jesus and our hymnody, we understand the lyric. We understand the lyric of the Psalms of the Old Testament. We understand the lyric of the, of the hymns that we sing unto the Lord. And that's what gives rise to the praise and to the celebration. And when we contemplate who God is and what God has done, how can we not celebrate in our worship? Yes, we need to be, we need to reverence God in our worship. This is where much of the church has it wrong. It's all about celebration, but it's not about we're coming into the presence of a righteous and a, a holy God who is a consuming fire. Here's the beauty of new covenant worship. That God who is holy and righteous and a consuming fire. That God that we must fear. That God before whom we fall upon our faces is your Savior. He is your Father. So with reverence, we are to celebrate in our worship of God. I love the liturgy of Presbyterian worship. We mine the scriptures to discover what are the elements of worship, what is prescribed in the word. With these are the things we're going to do and nothing beside them. The regulative principle of worship that governs our worship, I believe, is a biblical principle rooted in the second commandment itself. I love the order we find in our liturgy, and the substance that we find there, and the psalms and hymns that we choose to sing, and the creeds that we choose to confess, the substance of the scripture readings, of the prayers, of the preaching, of the sacraments. But it should never be appear to us or anyone to be dead and ritual. And frankly, people who come and visit here, who come from, from other traditions, which are more celebratory and, and no real sense of reverence or awe, I don't think when they come in this church that if they judge rightly that they're going to think the worship at Shiloh is dead at all. but robust, alive. Because I think this congregation already understands Psalm 150 before I preach it. And takes these matters seriously. I've been to churches where people are going through the motions. May it never be of this congregation. Where in the sanctuary, in the mighty heavens, why? Because of his mighty deeds, because of his excellent greatness, how? With great celebration and, and joy, yes, and reverence. Now who is to praise the Lord? Verse 6, let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You see how we're coming to consummation? 
That verse is not true. Oh, that sounded bad, didn't it? It's not yet a fact. Because everything that has breath doesn't praise the Lord. There may be somebody here tonight who's breathing and your heart is far from God and you've not entered into the worship. Unbelievers don't praise the Lord. They curse and blaspheme His name. More openly than in any time I could remember in my lifetime today. But the day is coming when everything that hath breath will praise the Lord. He will bow. Of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will confess of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those who are under the earth can no more hide. The day of His coming, they will know who he is. It will not be with joy that they will say, Jesus Christ is Lord, but they cannot help but utter it as fact. And they will spend eternity in hell, still recognizing Jesus Christ has been given the name that is above every name. And they will be tormented for their rebellion. But in the new heavens and the new earth, everything that hath breath, everything that hath breath will praise the Lord. I want to turn to Revelation 19. The book of the Revelation to John 19. Remember I told you this morning that hallelujah is only found in one book in the Old Testament. We know which one that one is. The Psalms. You want to know where it's first found in the New Testament? After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! There it is. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just. For He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, you who fear Him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Psalm 150 anticipates Revelation 19. We've come to the consummation. We're going to pray, and then we're going to stand together and sing the doxology. I'm tempted tempted to say, no, let's sing the hallelujah chorus. But I think we would need to practice a little bit before we do that. 
So we're going to pray. We're going to stand together. We don't need accompaniment. Let's just sing it. We're going to sing the doxology. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for for where the Psalter brings us. It brings us to the very consummation, to the anticipation of that time when everything that hath breath will praise the Lord. To the marriage feast of the Lamb. For the pronouncement of it. And the singing of hallelujah again. Lord, thank you for the psalms and thank you for this psalm. You are worthy to be praised. Amen.